Welcome, Martin, to the Run It Once podcast. You're in your gym, are you? Well, sort of. Gym slash office. It, is that where you work as well when you're grinding? Yeah. Yeah, I decided to combine the gym and the office, like the place where I spend my most of my time. Uh, I like it. I like it. So in your 15-minute breaks, quick wee, quick wee. Yeah. Pump some iron and then get back yeah, on the grind. Yeah, not a bad combo. Yeah. Um, you grew up on an island, right? Le- is it Ladingo? Uh, it's uh, oh, close. Ladinga. <laughs> <laughs> it's nowhere near close. Um, well, we, we would say Ladinga. Ladinga. What was it? What yeah. was it like growing up on? on I, I was going to say a little island, but there's about fifty thousand people that live there. But what was it like growing up there? Yeah, yeah, it's not that. It's pretty small, um, like land wise, but there's actually quite a few people living there. Uh, it was it was nice. Uh, it's good because it's uh, it's not too far away from the city. Uh, it's only like twenty minutes to get into the city center of Stockholm. Uh, but at the same time, it's it's nice because there's uh, a lot of nature and, and, and greenery and stuff. So it was nice to you know grow up in in that environment. And what what was your school like? Because where I grew up in uh, Ogmore Vale in South Wales, school was like a it was like a battleground. You know, it's like uh, you had you had all these kids who wanted to batter you if you weren't cool enough and it's like it's just like where do i go do i hide do i batter people do i run what what was it like what was it like growing up in your school i uh, it was uh yeah it wasn't really like that uh, if anything like i was probably the one doing the batting um <laughs> no i wasn't really you know i didn't fear anyone or anything like that but it was pretty friendly school overall it wasn't it wasn't that big so i think that helps um it's also an island which has like a reputation for like being a bit privileged uh if you will so a lot of uh uh you know rich families live out there it's uh, quite quite expensive but um so you know that that doesn't exactly bring the most hardcore kids uh, <laughs> it was more I would say it was more like a fight for like social status, you know, how, how it could be. Uh, people were comparing wealth and, and that sort of stuff. Talk about that a little bit more then, because obviously it's different today with social media and, and, and that and the likes. Probably didn't have that when when you were younger. Yeah, so how, God, how, yeah. how did you fit into that old status hierarchy? Mm, I, I would say I would... I was probably somewhere in between. Um, like I was in definitely not one of the, the rich kids. Um, uh, and, but I mean, yeah, everyone was pretty well off. So it wasn't, <laughs> uh, it wasn't really that much of a, like, a um, a rivalry or, or, um, yeah, it was, uh, I was somewhere in between, you know, I tried to not get involved in that like social status thing. I thought it was a bit ridiculous. Like it's never, uh, obviously it's not today, but even back then, like it's never really been my style. Mm, why, why is that then? Cause that's, that's really interesting. Cause that runs counter to my, I, I've started to learn through these interviews actually that I, I was really immature as a kid. Right. Cause I, I, I get that the, the people, like when you say, I looked at that and I thought it was a load of nonsense. That's like a mature way of looking at it, right? Whereas mm-hmm. when I was a kid, it was like, why is that kid got Nike trainers on, man? And, I, and, and I've got to wear Gola. And now because I'm wearing Gola, someone's going to look at them and go, ha, ah, look at that poor kid. He's got Gola trainers. Like I couldn't get mature about that. Like I, I, I was just like in the thick of it. So where, where, did, uh, where did that come from, from you, for you? Um, I don't know. Probably the, the way I was raised. Um, like neither of my parents are, are really like that. So I think it comes a lot from, uh, your parents and, and the way you brought up. Uh, but it's also possible, you know, that I have a very like glorified view of myself today that what I, what I actually was back then. So, um, yeah, that's just uh, like from what I remember. So you had, you had good sense of esteem, I guess. Like you, did you ever go through periods where 
your you were affected by low self esteem and you started to question your standing in life as as a as a youngster growing up. Yeah, I think that's something that like basically all uh, all young people go through at at least at some stage of their lives. Um, so yeah, I was definitely not an exception. You know, it's a constant battle of trying to fit in and trying to figure out who you really are and like, what do you want to do and and where do you belong? Um, so you, so yeah, I was, it was definitely, uh, something that I was dealing with as well. What, what age, uh, uh, around was you when you was, uh, kind of struggling the most about trying to make sense of things? Um, the most like sensitive age was probably when I was like around 15, 16, which I guess is quite common because that's when you start making the real tough decisions of like where, which school do you want to go to next? At least that's how it works in, in Sweden. Uh, you make that decision at, at a fairly young age where like in reality, no one really knows what they want to do. It's just, you know, throwing, starts on a board and, and hope they stick. Um, so, um, but that's uh, how I got into uh, culinary school. Uh, so I was quite fed up with school when I was about 15, 16. Um, so during that period, that's when you decide where, where you want to go next. And uh, all of my friends at the time, they, they were just sticking on the island and, and, continuing to, to doing, you know, the academic studies. Uh, but for me, well, it was actually my mom that influenced that decision because she was the one that, you know, uh, nagging on me to, to do my homework. And she didn't want to, she didn't exactly want to do, uh, deal with that for another six or seven years. So she's, she was looking at alternatives and then she found this uh, culinary school and, and said to something along the lines that I like, oh, always enjoyed cooking. Why don't you try this out? Because it was, um, uh, it was uh, a culinary school, but it was combined. So you did actually uh, read the academic classes as well. So in case you felt like it wasn't for you, you could always switch and, and you know, choose a different path at some point. Uh, so it felt like a good alternative, and that's what I did. My uh, my boy at the moment is working, I would say, between part-time and full-time in a restaurant. And I, I keep asking him, so is, is this it? Like, uh, are you f- is, is this something that you want to pursue? And he's like, nah, dad, it's just, just a way of making money. I, I don't know what I want to do yet. Um, what was it like when you was in culinary school? Was there, you know, like Gordon Ramsay falls in love with, love with it and ends up being Gordon Ramsay? Uh, you end up being a world champion of poker. I mean, where was your head at while you were there cooking things? Um, it was it was actually really good. Uh, it was probably one of the best decisions that I've ever made. Uh, well, thanks to my mom uh, that found this opportunity because I immediately um, became more passionate about cooking and and fell in love with that aspect and like eager to learn uh, all the different concepts. It was really, uh, really ambitious, like from the start. And at the same time, since I was doing something more practical, uh, I felt less pressure to perform in like the academic classes. Right. And the bar was also set a lot lower, I guess, than um, what it would have. Sorry. <laughs> you can keep you can keep your James Bond cap. <laughs> yeah. Um, the bar was also set a lot lower, so it wasn't that hard to shine. So like. I was probably, you know, at the top, at least at the top of chip in my class. So uh, um, my grades were all improved, uh, and uh, yeah, I started enjoying school again because I finally found something that was more suitable for me than just sitting in a, behind a school desk for eight hours every day. Did um, did. When you do, it sounds like I'm. I'm assuming a little bit, so you can set me straight. But it sounds like uh, the school work you didn't like it. I, I assume that the grades, because you didn't like it, the grades weren't going quite so well. Did, does that then tie into status? I, I know when my my son went up to sixth form, for example, 
when his grades started to lessen, he really didn't, he felt like he was an outsider, like, like yeah. that pressure of not being able to perform. Did you, was that an aspect? Um, not, I mean, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, for sure. You were comparing grades. My grades weren't terrible. They were, they were quite polarized. So like, you know, like the practical classes, I had like the, you know, straight A's and, uh, and you know, and the more, uh, in my opinion, boring <laughs> classes like, <laughs> that I didn't find that interesting. I, I, you know, I, I, would, I didn't fail any class or, or anything, but they, they were, you know, on the lower side of things. Uh, and I think also, you know, if your grades are struggling, then you might struggle to get into the school you want uh, next. But that's pretty much all the grades are good for. You know, you stress so much about getting good grades, but it's really only to get you to the next step, to get you into a new school. And then once you're in there, then your previous grades don't matter. How did you handle pressure back then? And now knowing, you know, the benefit of hindsight and experience, how would you deal with that differently or teach your kid, 15-year-old kid, to deal with pressure? Oof. Um I think I was pretty poor at, at, at dealing with pressure back then. I think that's a skill that I've sort of developed over the years. Like one, breaking in a kitchen, uh, and then, of course, playing professional poker for so many years now. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't think I don't think it's like a natural skill set that I was born with or it developed very early, but more so something that I was like sort of forced to, to learn and adapt to. When you say that you was poor at it, how did that manifest itself in your life then? Was you was you having fits? Was you getting into fights? Was you crying to your mom? I mean how how did it manifest? Yeah, I was probably pretty uh you know, naughty teenager. Um like I wasn't doing my homework. I I didn't care for it and you know, getting in fights with my mom about it because she was dressing up because she knew like how important it was and she could see I didn't care and um uh, um so yeah that was I probably didn't to be honest I didn't know how to deal with, with that sort of stress back then. Um so uh it was just pure frustration, you know, of not feeling like feeling interested enough about it or having the the enough motivation to to push through and how was how has ambition littered itself around your life you know from from being a kid to today you know give us a little feel about how ambition has fitted into your life because i know a lot of poker players are, are driven by ambition you know mm. i've all i feel like as long as i'm motivated or feel strongly or passionate about something i'm very ambitious so starting in in, in culinary school and uh, falling in love with cooking that was probably my first ambition i uh, i knew straight away that i wanted to you know, work myself up to the top and eventually work at a michelin star restaurant and you know learn all the the different cooking methods and, and uh, skills that, that there was to learn. Um, and going over to, to poker, uh, I guess I felt uh, a similar time of ambition, a similar type of ambition. Um, but it was most, it wasn't, I've never like, I didn't, I've never like striven to be number one in poker. It's more, I want to perform at the highest level that I know that I'm capable of. So like to prove to myself that I'm doing everything I can to, to compete at that level. Like that's, that's good enough for me uh, mm -hmm. because I, I realized that that's, that's all I can do. And you, you ended up joining the military. Was that, was that your first work experience or did you work in a kitchen before you joined the military? I worked in a kitchen uh, before I, I, uh, I joined, but uh, only for a brief period of time. So the way it works in Sweden is the, 
the recruits for the military, they come to school when you're about 15. So like a year before you graduate high school. Um, or no, elementary school. And that's when they, that's when you sign up. So you sign up when you're 15. They show you a bunch of cool videos of like people shooting guns and traveling the world. <laughs> <laughs> they really sell you on it. And uh, of course, you go to like a physical exam and, and you do a brief interview um, to make sure that you, you're, you're fit for service. Uh, and then, yeah, you just sign a contract. And, and if you get accepted, then, then that's it. Uh, and then by the time you're 20 uh, or 21, no, 20, uh, it's time to... Uh, you know, become a, a recruit. Uh, so that's after you've done with high school. So like I, I signed up when I was 15. I was still in elementary school. Uh, went to a culinary school, high school. Grew up to the point when I was 20, graduated high school, was ready to, you know, become a chef and work, <laughs> work myself up in the, uh, you know, the, the restaurant scene in Stockholm. And that's when, you know, the military recruits come knocking at your door. And, and you're like, oh, I, going I the military. You're like, oh, fuck, I did that. <laughs> or, yeah, sort of. It's, like, it's not something you think about when, when you were in high school because there's, yeah. there's so much else to think about at that point. But once you graduate and you realize, oh, shit, in six months I'm going to have to do this or I'm going to have to come up with like a really good excuse not to, um, it's uh yeah it was, it was a bit depressing <laughs> it's so funny it's so funny our mindsets are different and worldviews and, and times and cultures like how you could think that like joining the army is like super cool where i was be i'd be thinking well i could die and like and that's right it was super not cool <laughs> like yeah. what did your parents feel they about you joining the military uh, they didn't advertise that aspect of it <laughs> <laughs> But it, I mean, no, it's, just, this wasn't like, it's not like joining, you're, you're not joining the army, you're, you're joining like the defense force. You know, it's, it's only, you're only at risk of, <laughs> of dying really if you're, if Sweden ever goes to war, you know, then they can call you up and say, hey, but we need you here. You got to defend the country. But. So you, you, was, you, you had to think about that then. You wasn't, you wasn't, you didn't just dive into it. You was kind of like, okay, you know, what's, what's the, what's the odds here that I'm going to go into it? <laughs> no. no, no, no. I mean, I was 15. I was just looking at those videos with the guns. <laughs> <laughs> so what I was it like? I, I didn't join the army. I, I joined the, the Navy. The yeah. Swedish Navy. Uh, so I was, a I I was a cook on one of the, uh, one of the chips, one of the fleets. And uh, it was uh, it was a new ship, a battleship that uh, it's it's pretty cool actually. Yeah, it's like a, a stealth mode, uh, so you can't spot it on the radar. And it's a pretty small crew. It's like uh, 30, 30, 40, uh, uh, or twenty. It was about twenty uh, officers and twenty uh, uh, recruits. Uh, so I was cooking, me and, and another recruit were responsible for all their meals. And uh, uh, it was pretty fun, actually. Uh, the, I would say the hardest part was the, um, the hardest part was the, like the, the period you go through uh, that everyone has to do before you just, before you get on the battleship, uh, where you, you know, learn learn to shoot and like that stuff was fun but there was a lot of other stuff like um, girls and stuff that <laughs> that wasn't that, that enjoyable yeah you see you see the movies with the you know the the seniors screaming in your face and you're doing press-ups in the icy mud uh, a little bit like that was it yeah sort of like that they want to see how tough you are and how durable you are one of my um my boy worked at triton million with us like um he had like uh, an internship there, you know, and okay. part of his role was to feed the crew. It's like 46 people. So obviously <laughs> he didn't cook, he, but he had to make sure that all the food was delivered and stuff. And mm -hmm. on the first day I said to him, what's it like, him, boy? And he said, 
He said, the worst part is when you put the food down and then you can hear him talking about how shit it is. And then you feel really bad because you bought it. Like yeah. if, you're, if you're stuck on a battleship with 30 people yeah. did, how, and now you're starting to be a man, right? How do you, how did you deal with feedback and, and feedback not necessarily being great feedback? Oh, it was always great. <laughs> <laughs> is that I, good? Yeah, I didn't. I wouldn't have it any other way. No, but the the good, the fun thing about it was that uh, everyone in the navy, they especially the officers, they they love their food. They're very passionate about the, the, the meals. Um, and the other great part is that you have a really <laughs> generous budget that comes out of the taxpayers' money. I suppose mm-hmm. we we got you know infinite more. Uh, infinite bigger budget than you would for like a school meal, for example. So we could buy pretty much whatever we wanted. Like we bought yeah, duck breasts, um, like filet mignon, uh, whatever we wanted. You were, you, you were Michelin star battleship. Yeah. And so it was a great time because we could set the menu as well. So me and my buddy were like planning all the meals or placing all the orders, uh, cooking everything ourselves and then yeah, you know, getting great feedback. So that part, uh, I really enjoy it. So, you know, in any, in any story arc, we've got a hero, which is you. And at some point they're going to receive the call to adventure to leave their ordinary world. But to you, it, it seems like you are, you're in this culinary business, right? And you're cooking and that seems like it's going to be your future. What happened? Why did that change? Um, well, so after I was done with military service, I was there for 11 months. I continued to work in, in some restaurants in Stockholm. Um, and then during that time, so I, this was uh, in 2006, 2007. 2007, I was, I was, um, and joining the military. And it was also during this time that uh, poker blew up and uh, I started playing, um, you know, amongst my friends and, and some online. Uh, so during this whole process, I was playing poker, you know, as a hobby and, and uh, yeah, just for fun and was able to make a little bit of extra money doing so. Um, so after I uh, left the military, I, I worked at a restaurant in Stockholm. And um, at the time, I, was, I started playing more and more poker. I was playing poker sort of as like a, a cool down process after the long shifts uh, in the kitchen. And uh, I had a little bit of success and uh, managed to win a seat to the WSOP uh, in 2008. So this was like by far the biggest thing I've ever won. And uh, I had the option to either take the money or, or go and play. Uh, so I, I choose to go and play, of course. Uh, <laughs> didn't know anyone at the time. Uh, didn't you know have a budget to bring any friends or anything. So I went to Vegas by myself. Um, I was only 20 years old at the time. Um, and... My birthday, my 21st birthday was three days before the main event. So superstitious as I've always been, I, I sort of saw, saw it as a sign uh, that this was meant to be and I was going to be the youngest main event champion ever. <laughs> Even though I've never like played a big live tournament before. I have really only played uh, sitting goes uh, online and that's how I qualified. Um, but anyway, so I went to Vegas uh, the summer of 2008 while I was working at this restaurant in, in Sweden. Uh, and I <laughs> didn't go so well. Like, I, I had a great time, but I got eliminated on the third hand. Uh, <laughs> so I guess that was, that was the sign. It was my birthday three days before the main event, the main event and I was going to get eliminated on the third hand of the main event. Um, so that was a that was a bit of a bitter experience. You know, it's lost essentially ten thousand dollars, which I could have cashed in if I would have been more financially responsible. But, 
uh, nevertheless, I, I didn't really regret my decision to go um, because it gave me like a, a blooded tooth almost to keep playing uh, poker and, and, and try to get into more live tournaments because I still had a lot of fun, uh, you know, traveling. So uh, uh, once I got back to uh, Stockholm, I kept working at this restaurant and uh, I haven't, having been to Vegas uh, for the very first time, having been to America for the very first time or done a, a trip by myself for the very first time, I, I knew that I wanted to uh, travel more and, and see what else was out there. And uh, during one of our, parties at this restaurant where I work for, for the staff but when I, I spoke to uh, one of my co-workers and she was like briefly mentioning uh, her friend who works uh, at a worked at a Michelin star restaurant in Barcelona a three star Michelin uh, star restaurant and uh, she said that they were looking for, for chefs uh, so I immediately jumped on that and and said, I'm in. <laughs> so I resigned from uh, my current job in Stockholm and uh, was all set to go to Barcelona and work myself. You know, I, I was well aware that I was going to start at the bottom peeling onions or whatever I, I needed to do, but I was still set on, on working myself to the top eventually and you know, live in Barcelona, which is i had been to a few times and I really enjoyed. Um, so I resigned from my job. And um, during this period, once I had resigned, um, I couldn't get a hold of my contact who set up the job. And she just you know, went out there. I, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't really, I still can't figure out what happened. But anyway, she went MIA and I spoke to like our common friends no one had heard from her. It, it was really strange. Um, so, so yeah. So I was out of out of an immediate income or job, but which wasn't that stressful at the time because I didn't have any major expenses. I had a little bit of savings, and I was living at home. And um, of course, I was playing poker at the time, so I had a little bit of a, a side income and. Uh, you know, somewhere to spend my time. So I wasn't really stressing about finding a new job. I was just sort of putting it aside and saying like, well, I'm going to wait and see what happens and maybe she'll call one day. And during the time, during the wait, I'm just going to play more poker. Uh, so that's sort of what happened. And then, you know, I qualified for the next tournament uh, in London. Um, didn't go so well, but it went better than three hands at least. And, I got some more experience and um, now this was success online and uh, yeah, eventually qualified to EPT Budapest. This was only a couple months after being to Vegas and in Budapest, I uh, managed to get third place. So that was a huge, uh, well, both bankroll and, and confidence boost and I, I guess what I needed to you know, keep pursuing poker and, and give it a serious shot. Okay, so that a, a question I've got on that is: when I first got into poker, I got to be honest, I've never felt anything in my life more all-consuming than that. Like I, I used to love football, and and football was my thing, but poker took it to a new level. I don't know whether it was the money, I don't know what it was, the gamble, but we were consumed in it. We were reading poker magazines, watching poker TV shows, talking about it, playing it. When, when you said you was working in the kitchen and you was playing a little bit of poker, how much was poker taking over your life? Was it just a little hobby or was it becoming all-consuming? I was becoming more and more consuming, for sure. Um, it's just what you described. At the time, you know, I think we all felt it. Anyone who, who had their eyes on poker, it was everywhere. Um, whether you wanted it or not, it was in magazines, it was on TVs, so it was books. So it was a uh, all like all my friends at least like had a poker set and, and was playing on the weekend. So um, yeah, I was definitely starting to consume more of my time and, and something I was seriously getting into. And 
when so now we we're a little bit clear on your story now the the michelin job kind of dies you've gone from the ordinary world being your island which i can't pronounce to the special to the special world being poker and your first experience of that special world is a world series of poker i mean and you go on your own uh, what was you what were the emotions and feelings that you were going through when you when you were traveling over there when you got there like when you busted i mean what was you feeling oh there was a, a lot of emotions obviously <laughs> um well first of just traveling by yourself is like a complete new experience um i hadn't really thought much about it until you know i said goodbye to my mom <laughs> And my girlfriend at the time dropped me off at the airport. And then as I was walking towards the gate, I just realized how, how quiet it was. And like, who am I going to speak to? This was like one before like podcasts were a thing or, or anything like that. So, uh, <laughs> but then, uh, you know, you kind of, or I at least like forced myself to snap out of it. And like, you become comfortable in your own company, like pretty fast. Uh, so I think it was I think it was a good experience. Uh, like it kind of forces you to engage and, and speak to other people, which I also assume was much easier back then when we didn't have we weren't as consumed by our cell phones and, and all that stuff. Uh, so it was easier to to interact with with people that you didn't know. So or already on the flight, I met. I was sitting next to a Swedish couple uh, that I became friends with, and uh, you know we went for dinner in Vegas. And then while I was in Vegas, I met uh, someone who's like a close friend of mine now. He's from Canada. He was just random. Him, him and his friends were just randomly like by the pool, and we started talking. And he was there for poker and. He thought it was cool that like I was there by myself and like I was from Sweden and stuff. So uh, we hung out and, uh, and yeah, and then the the tournament came around and and it was time to to play. And <laughs> I was uh, extremely nervous. Uh, showed up probably thirty minutes before the tournament started. Uh, just you know scouting out everything. Like went to all the different rooms at the Rio. I had a backpack and planned, like I was very organized. Like even back then, I prepared meals and drinks that I was gonna <laughs> consume <laughs> during the day. I was because I knew it was gonna be a long one, you know, like twelve hour day. I wasn't sure like how the brakes worked or anything like that. Um, <laughs> I was all geared up in like my qualifier gear, or whatever it was. And uh, yeah, I was, I was ready. And then I guess I was a little bit too excited and I got a bit of a cooler where, you know, today I wouldn't have gone broke. But back then I, I went for it and it didn't work out. You, you said um, I, it was lovely to hear your journey from, you know, realizing that you're all alone when everybody leaves you and, and you slowly finding friends. Is that something that comes naturally to you? Communicate with people and strangers? Or is it something no, you no. have to work out? No, definitely not. Um, like thinking back at it, like I'm, I'm quite surprised like how it worked out. But I think in both both cases, it was more uh, them, you know, taking the first step and, and interacting with me, and then me being open, you know, to conversation. Which again, I, I don't think today I might have not been, you know, today I would have. Definitely, you know, had my headphones on, like listen to a podcast or watch a movie or something. Mm. Um, so it's it's a bit sad that we don't have that interaction anymore. Those like natural, organic conversations that used to be a thing. I think well, it's quite rare. Today. Especially like listening to your point there, because if you're not really comfortable with it, and then you're forced into that environment. You know, suddenly you're developing new skills. I, I imagine like the first time you ever, ever dumped into a kitchen. I've worked in a kitchen. It is manic. Like you, you, you get challenged straight away and people don't really have the time to kind of look after you or babysit you. You just have to get on with it, right? So you're, mm -hmm. you're kind of learning. So it, it, is, um, it, is, it is difficult how the world is changing where people are kind of spoon fed a little bit more and a little bit more kind of in their own head, you know, do you think? Yeah, for sure. And also my personality type is such that 
I'm quite introverted, so I don't naturally it doesn't come natural to me to you know engage in conversations necessarily. I'm more of a quiet observer. Like I'm very approachable if someone you know starts talking to me, but I'm I'm not. It doesn't come natural to me to take the first step and, and interact. So then you get third in Budapest, and then after that, your your career kind of kind of booms. But I want to focus on on the third place in, in Budapest. Um, did you just did you just rock up and then you kind of luckily got third place, or was you the type of player then that was putting a lot of work in and was actually thinking you was going to do well in Budapest? Where, where was you on that spectrum? Uh, I mean, it was probably a combination of, of both. Like I was. <laughs> you know, studying, if you want to call it that, you know, by, you know, reading poker magazines or whatever you did back then, reading uh, the books, uh, Harrington and Holden and, and, and those kind of things. Uh, there really wasn't much tools, many tools like in 2008, you know, available. Um, so, yeah, and, and I also, you know, I had an incredible drive and like was really determined to, you know, perform better. Um but of course, I had a, like, a huge amount of luck to to get third place. Like I was definitely one of the least experienced players in the field, even though obviously the the play quality was a lot weaker than mm. than in today's standards. But still, like uh, like most of the the big names, you know, were there, and uh, it was pretty cool to you know get that rush and like get the the right cards at the right time. Uh, I remember uh, the second day I was a uh, chip leader <laughs> of the entire field. And uh, this was my third live tournament, uh, like ever. And I barely played any. I played some online tournaments, but not that many. So, you know, I had no idea how to approach, you know, being the ship leader. So I just assumed that as the ship leader, you, you got to start, you know, playing more aggressively, and, like push people around. Uh, so that cost me a little bit. And I, yeah, I immediately lost the ship late and, and then humbled me a little bit, I guess, which was good because then that made me more conservative. I think I didn't fight to get it back because I realized that I've been pretty lucky to get there in the first place. And that was a big six figure score, right? Yeah, I cashed for, I think officially I cashed for slightly less than 200 mm. uh, euros. And then, but we made a, a three way deal. Uh, I was uh, lucky, I guess. I got, you know, when those three people left, my uh, other two opponents were, uh, I'm pretty confident they were amateurs, so they were happy to make a deal, uh, whereas maybe the more experienced pros wouldn't have entertained that idea. So I managed to make a deal uh, for an extra 50 or 60,000. Uh, so I cashed for about two fifty, and that was that all yours. Most of it, I think I had one swap, <laughs> right? <laughs> one five five percenter, right? Okay, uh, which was yeah, my one of my few Swedish poker friends, or maybe my only. I had like two Swedish poker friends back then. You lucky guy. Um, I'm going to ask you a random question on money. Now we're talking about it. Um, when might you have been able to ask for more money? if you hadn't lost confidence? Uh, at what point? Yeah. Is there a time in your life where you could have asked for more money, but you lost confidence? Hmm. Or if you don't want to be specific, how confident are you around asking those things and dealing with those things around money? Asking other people for money? No, well, for example, you 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 know you're an ambassador at eight eight eight, for example. So mm-hmm. how how comfortable and confident are you going into those situations, being like, "Hi, Martin Jacobson, this is what I want," or are you kind of a little bit like, oh, "I don't really want to talk about money." Like, where where are you on the money scale of things? I think that's something. Yeah, I don't think many people are. are enjoying those type of conversations or specifically good at knowing exactly what they're worth. It's a lot easier to put a value on something you're not immediately attached to. Like I can tell you what I think that, you know, another player is worth or this product is worth. Uh, but when, when it's about yourself, it becomes 
almost too personal. And uh, I guess it also like it has to do with feeling of you like your self worth. Like, where do you put yourself on a scale, and like, how much do you think you're worth? And I think uh, I'm pretty sure that I'm I'm doing this as well. Uh, but I think it's quite common that you're constantly undervaluing yourself. Like you don't think that you work as much as you might be because you, you don't want to, you know, shoot too high and, 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 um, you know, make, make it seem that you think you work more than you actually are, because that's worse than asking for too little and getting it. And you also don't want to get turned down because that's not a good feeling. It's, uh, it's almost tied up with status again, isn't it? I, it's like um, I don't want them to think that I'm a big shot, but I don't want to kind of undersell my. It's that always that constant battle about status. Yeah. Hmm. So, so you have two hundred thousand, uh, you know, there, thereabouts. Uh, how old were you then? Tw- early twenties. I was twenty-one. Yeah. Right. I mean, if I had that kind of money when I was twenty, that would have been mass. That would that literally would have been life changing for me. I think thinking back at it, like what what was it like having that kind of money at at, at that age? Oh, it's definitely life changing. Um, you know, I, I went from making like fifteen, about fifteen twenty thousand a year, maybe at best as a as a cook. Yeah, to you know, having 200 and 250 in my bank account uh, in like a few days' work. Uh, so that obviously inspired me too, to um, as well to continue playing poker and and focusing more time and energy towards that. But it wasn't it wasn't so much about the money aspect. Like for me, it's always been I've never like really chased that chased anything else with like money other than continuing to play poker because like that's what i enjoy so for me it's more important to make money in poker so i can keep playing poker if that makes sense yeah tremendous because because uh, i mean i guess it's you can broaden that as well with you you, with your work on reg and we'll talk about a little bit later but the more money you have if your values are right the more money you have the more good you could do with it so it becomes really important to get money also status of life you know life status like you know let's say let's say that time you flew to vegas when you was 21 and you you had a fling with someone and ended up having a kid and then you you move back to to sweden well you're gonna need flight money to go see your kid every now so it's not about i i want to buy myself a new pair of trainers is it you know it's like money can mean very different things to different people but i'm interested i assume you're still living at home then when you went uh when when you went in budapest and yeah you know, I was. everything i read ab- about you online your mum comes up a lot like like it's a really important person in your life what was going on there then because i could uh, i can imagine my mum saying oh, okay okay martin you know I think you should give me some of that money so I can put it away for you. And you're going, no, man, there's this thing called bankroll in poker. I mean, <laughs> what, what was happening under that score? Uh, no, although, like, I would say my mom's been, like, you know, partly responsible for, for my success because she's always, like, put me in the right direction, even though I made my own. I always felt like I made my own decisions. She was also the one who told me to go to Vegas to not take the money and to go to Vegas and, and gamble, uh, so or play poker, uh, which she knew that was you know the the answer I wanted to hear and something I really wanted to do. Um, but uh, yeah, it's I you know winning that that kind of that amount of money when you're that young and you don't have a, a business degree or a, any academic degree at all and you know how what do you do with that, that kind of money the only thing i i knew was a safe bet like a good investment um was a property so i i bought myself a flat um not straight away but you know a year or so later uh, so I can move out from uh, from home. Super cool. Because there's some people who just invest it all in themselves, and 
you know, there's, oh, there's yeah, I, did, I did that too. <laughs> <laughs> so have, have, have there been times in your career that you've been broke as well as uh, doing really well? No, I've, I've been pretty fortunate uh, in terms of, you know, where my, when my scores have come. Um, so I've, I, I had a very hot streak early on, which gave me a nice boost and, you know, the confidence to keep playing and, and, and doing well and competing at the highest level. Um, and then, of course, I've over the path of my career, I've had, you know, downswings that's last for months, like even years. So those are the, the tough parts. Um, but I've never been... I've been cash broke, but never broke broke. That makes sense. Did you ever have a problem dropping down in stakes? Yeah, that's a it's a tough thing, you know, for for your confidence, but also your your motivation. Perhaps you know, we used to playing at a certain level uh, against certain opponents, and then have to to drop down. But no, I because again, like I'm, I've never. It's never been my immediate goal to be the number one uh, poker player in the world. So therefore, it's more I play for like pure love of the game. And whenever I'm in a downswing, it motivates me more so than ever to keep studying, keep getting better, keep putting the hours in, grinding, uh, trial and error, um, grind it out and just get back. Um, to the level where I want to be. It's that time of the show where you complain about adverts. Get over it. Run It Once Poker is one of the newest and coolest online poker sites in the world. And its owner, Phil Galfon, if he was a Peaky Blinder, he would be called Tommy. Phil plays on the site and streams regularly, so you can have a chin while with him while he takes all of your money. If you sign up today at once.run forward slash hero play, you will receive a 100% welcome bonus up to 600 euros. That deposit breaks down into two super cool parts. First, it never expires as long as you play one hand every 30 days. And even I could do that. Second, all of your deposits during your first 30 days count towards the bonus. Now, if you're pretty rubbish at poker or are very good and want to get even better, then Run It Once has your back. Run It Once training gives you the chance to learn from some of the best players in the world with two brand spanking new training videos added daily. If you sign up through once.run forward slash hero learn, you will get access to free, free elite videos, including one from the gentle, not so giant, Mr. Phil Galfon. Now, back to today's hero, Martin Jacobson. I'm interested on the, the money side of things because as somebody who's still working hard to try to get to a position where I'm financially free, all I can do is read about people who are financially free talking about their story. So I, I, I've not got the feeling, you know what I mean? So, so I'm interested, uh, how, how did it feel for you as you're going through life and you're earning more and more money or you're binking more and more scores compared to what the literature says out there that when you reach a certain level, your happiness doesn't relate to the amount of money you earn and it plateaus off? Mm -hmm. I'm very interested in how your happiness and your joy correlates to your income and, and how that has risen throughout your career, if you don't mind. Yeah. No, it's an interesting it's an interesting topic for sure. Um I I would say I would definitely agree that your happiness level, at least for me, doesn't affect my income or, or the other way around. My income doesn't affect my happiness level. Like it doesn't matter how much money I have in the bank. Like that, that has no correlation with how happy I am. What I would say though is that financial stress can really make you miserable and, and have a huge impact on, on the rest of your life. So I don't think that's good for, for anyone. So. Um, I think it's important to be financially stable. Um, that makes sense. And don't let stress over money, how to pay the bills or how to play a certain tournament or how to repay a debt or 
whatever it may be, um, have that sort of stress linger over you because that feedback can definitely drain your happiness. If money doesn't make you happy, what does? Um, again, like freedom, you know, being able to do what I love, which is you know, play poker. I love to you know, keep healthy and work out, learn new things. Um, help other people, um, create things, learn new skills, and yeah, figure out what I want to do next. You know, keep always keep that ambition high, like never, never be satisfied. Back to this uh, journey then, there's always a time in every story where the hero rejects the call, right? So Rocky says he's going to fight Apollo, then he's not going to fight Apollo, then he is going to fight Apollo. <clears throat> when you're in poker, and I know you hit success very early, so it'd be interesting to hear what you say. Was there ever a time where, well, two questions. One, when did you decide to chuck all your eggs in one basket and be pro? And two, was there a point particularly early doors when you when you did a similar thing to the chef in and you said to yourself no actually I, I don't think this is for me you know so take the two of them when did you go pro and was there a time when you ever quit so going pro was never something i really decided it was just sort of sort of just happened um you know because i didn't go to barcelona in the end and i, I never uh applied for any new jobs so i just kept playing poker and then the success kind of fed, you know, my journey. And then I, I never really looked back. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I've got to stop you there. I've got to stop you there. Because that, that again, it's mirroring something that's happening with my boy at the moment. You know, you what? It's, it's mirroring something that's happening with my son right now. So I'm really curious uh, curious about it. Because, okay. So he he's just applied for an apprenticeship with his company and he's waiting to hear. But while he's waiting, he's not applying for other jobs. And he's really kind of laid back about it, right? Uh -huh. but as me as his dad i'm like why aren't you applying for five jobs every day yeah. so when when i hear you say well i wasn't really making a decision that poker was going on you know the the barcelona job i was kind of hoping the woman would ring but kind of giving up hope and i'm just kind of playing poker what's going through your head though like it, it are you just thinking to yourself well i don't have to worry about money i can live with my mum forever if i want to like um are you saying to yourself Oh, you're such a failure, Martin. Like you need to get out of this house and and, and earn money, poke a better work. Like, what are the internal conversations that are going on back then? No, I was I was pretty relaxed about the whole thing. With you know, I was 21 at the time. It's not like I was, you know, in my 30s. Uh, I think mean, I would have had a different approach then. So at that point, you're you're pretty, you're still pretty immature, and you kind of just going with the flow. Um, but yeah, I definitely think obviously it, it, it was to to my benefit to to have that mindset because had I not kept an open mind and would have been like, well, no, you need to, to get a job, or if I was pushed too much from my parents to to get another job, then then maybe that's what I would have done, and then that would have shut the door for poker, and I wouldn't have you know had the career that I've had because of it. So. Yeah, I mean, it sounds cliche, but I think like everything sort of happens for a reason. I, if you do let it, so if you have an open mind about things and, and don't get too snowed in on different paths that maybe other people say that you should take, then I think there's a lot of possibilities and, and doors that will open up just naturally. So that's sort of like a philosophy that I've tried to adapt, like even at the later stage of my poker career now when perhaps poker isn't going to be around for for that many more years uh, at least it doesn't look like it right now so um, um i'm you know i'm always keeping an open eye and, and, and open mind on what i want to do next and, and look for other options and opportunities mm, it, so it sounds like when you're that 21 year old uh, kid kind of figuring things out the freedom to do that by your parents must have been critical. Yeah, for sure. But I've always, like, even when I was 15, like, I've always, you know, done my own thing. Mm. Sort of. Like, I've, I've never, I've never been very good with authority. 
I was actually living, so my, my parents are separated. They separated when I was 12. And at the time we were living, me and my sister, she's five years younger. We were living um, sort of one week with my dad and one week with my mom. And then uh, once I got a bit older and uh, during the time when I was fighting like the most with my mom, not making, um, uh, not doing my homeworks, uh, I decided to solely live with my dad. And my dad is a lot more, he's a lot more similar to me, like personality, personality wise. So he wasn't, you know, too stressed about it. Like he just let me do my thing and, and that, that really worked out. How difficult was it? hopping between family households because I, I've been divorced and I've got I had a son through that and I know that he found it really difficult what was that like um I mean it had, it had a pros and cons you know you had two bedrooms uh, <laughs> <you got laughs> two some, lots uh, of stuff yeah yeah and uh, you know you had um, you know <laughs> no week was the same <laughs> Uh, but it was also like a bit of an annoying step to move, you know, pack a bag every week and, and you know, switch up your routine or whatever you had. <laughs> uh, and then obviously, like, you never want to see your parents get divorced. But it really, I don't, I think, like, we as a family, like, we dealt pretty well with it and, and everyone's happy where they are right now. So. Mm. Did it did it influence your thoughts and feelings around relationships? Like, did you come away from that thinking I'm not going to do this or I'm going to do that? Or uh, yeah, that you? yeah, definitely. Um, so, like in Sweden, for example, like the divorce rate is just through the roof. Wow. Uh, <laughs> so, like most of my like it wasn't it wasn't an unusual thing that like your parents got separated. It was more like oh wow, your parents are still together yeah uh, right because it was so common like almost all my friends uh, was like had the same thing uh but they would yeah some would live like one week with their mom and one week with their dad or some would just pick one and do it that way or one would some would only have one parent and like in their life um but yeah i f- definitely think um like growing up in that sort of environment where that's so common has definitely affected my view on like long-term relationships and like how realistic it is to stay with the same person for forever like in terms of marriage and and, and such are you you in a relationship now i am yeah (laughs) (laughs) we're probably on dodgy ground talking about your thoughts and feelings around relationships and she comes, you know, from a from a, a family like a happy marriage family, like where the parents like really like love each other and, and they're very close. Uh, so, but that's also, you know, starting to change my view, or it definitely has already, and as I've become more mature and more aware of the situation, it's like opened up my view that, you know maybe I should be more open-minded and maybe, you know, it's not one for all. Like, what do I really want? Like, maybe this is, you know, something that I actually prefer. Yeah, there's a, there's a little theme kind of uh, emerging here where you're, you seem to have this ability to just not move too fast, you know, like, let's just see what happens and the story is going to change and I'm going to react to that and in a very mm-hmm. positive way. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm a very, I'm a very slow changer. Like if someone says, oh, okay, let's, let's completely you know, change this path. Then it takes me a long time to adjust and to weigh the different possibilities, the different, uh, the risks, the, the different outcomes and, and, the pros and the cons and until I make my final decisions. But Mm. once I do that, I'm, I'm very committed to that and and high ambitions, whatever, whatever it is. I'm going to ask you a question on relationships. Oh, I'm not going to ask you that one. (laughs) What is especially endearing about your partner? What do you really like about your partner? (laughs) 
I mean, a lot of things. Uh, I like that she's very different to me. I think we we complement each other very well. Um, I've uh, I've learned a lot from her um, personality wise. A lot of uh, you know relationships being one, and that relationships are important because. I have the tendency, I've always had a tendency of being a bit of a, a lone wolf that like I I enjoy my own company so much that like sometimes I don't, you know, make enough effort with friends or relationships or my family or, or whatever. Uh, so that's definitely something that I've become better at uh, a lot thanks to her. Do you have any deal breakers in relationships? So, so for example, mine is I, I wouldn't tolerate a woman hitting me for you know that. I think yeah, that's a good one. That that that's I have very few actually. I, and again, I I think I have very few. Some guys are into that. Well, because of like yeah yeah, because like you like I you know being with someone like one person for the rest of my life just seems to go against every single biological urge that I have in my body and, and any like logical, rational sense. So, so my list of like deal breakers are very small, but what, what about yours? What are your deal breakers in a relationship? Um, I mean, trust. I think trust is everything. Uh, I could never be with someone that I, I feel like I, I couldn't trust. Just the one. Uh, no, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot, but um, yeah, core values is another one. Um, we don't have to think, you know, have the same opinions about everything. <laughs> Definitely not. Mm. It'll be quite boring, but yeah, I still think you, you need the same core values, especially if you want to have a family one day to, to raise kids and make sure you're, you're on the same path and, and think the same way and that uh, about a lot of things is important. I remember I wrote an article once about how difficult it must be for a partner of a poker player. Uh, and, and I was coming from it from a point of view of the financial aspect. And I guess I, was, I wrote it from a working class, through a working class lens. So kind of like your wife wants a new pair of shoes or she wants you to take them on holiday, but you can't because you don't have any money. And then here you are going to lose 10 grand playing in a tournament. Like that must be difficult to manage. And I remember... Isaac Axon getting really upset at me about writing that article because he didn't think there was nothing wrong with, um, you know, people falling in love with poker players. Um, talk about your um, your life. How, how has being a poker player and a gambler, how has that affected your relationships, um, good or bad, like, you know, or indifferent, whatever? I think as a, as a poker player, you're always – striving to find that balance and battling to find that balance between work and, and personal life. Um, because we are, you are essentially a self-employed uh, entrepreneur. Um, so you're direct responsible for how much work you put in, how much holiday you take. Well, you know, but the, most difficult aspect of, of being a, a professional uh, poker player is that you have no control of, of the outcome of the game, of when your next paycheck is going to be. Uh, so that can be a lot, very, very stressful and, and hard to manage because you can't, you can't set a goal like, oh, I'm going to make this much of money this, this month so I can you know, settle these bills or, or, or do this that I really want or take this much time off. Uh, so you can really only measure it in how much work you put in, how much do you study, how much do you play, and then, you know, try to perform at your highest level and then find a balance where you you put, you put take time off uh, when, whenever it suits and then try to work that into your partners and your friends and your family's uh, schedules, uh, which isn't always that easy because you travel so much. And whenever I'm in London, for example, I, I tend to play online. That's, you know, working late nights, you become, you 
get on a different sleep schedule than everyone else. You're awake when everyone wants to sleep and vice versa. So it's tough to, to find that balance. Yeah. I'm, I'm, as you're saying that words are popping into my head. Like, um, I, I, I don't like authority. I don't like being told what to do. I, I like my own time and my own space. Um, you must, it, it sounds like you must have to really work hard at being present for someone in your life. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but that's another thing that I really like about, uh, my, um, my girlfriend is she's very understanding and uh, she's really, even though, you know, she had no experience about, um, dating a, a professional poker player, like no, not many girls do. Um, she's really like got the hang of it. Yeah. You know, she knows, um, uh, what it takes and like that whenever I say I'm playing, like I'm not just degenerating, like behind a computer or in the casino, like it's, you know, it's, it's my work. Like she takes it very seriously and respects it. So and there's never like, any questions asked like, Oh, do you have to play this like day or whatever? Like whenever I say that, uh, I need to work then she knows that, okay, that's work time. Or same goes with, we go on a trip and she comes, uh, on a poker trip. Like she's more like my assistant than my girlfriend, you know, like, is there yeah. anything you need, you know, like, okay, do you want to, if I bust the, the tournament, she's like, okay, do you want to just be alone at your, at your room, like for a bit, like <laughs> she gets it. So that's very nice. Um, how do you how do you ha- how do you handle your role in in that relationship in as much as it's pretty hard to even though she might not know nothing about poker or she didn't but when she met you it's pretty hard to get away from Martin Jacobson world champion won ten million quid right and even in my relationship as a as a f- freelancer who I help people quit alcohol I, I write I interview I, I do all that kind of stuff. Um, it's difficult for me not to kind of like put myself first in the relationship and then everybody has to work their schedules around me. And I know that that's like been massively difficult for my wife to, to accept and she shouldn't have to accept it. I have to climb down and and think differently as something like that happened in your life, given the status that you have as in, in poker. Yeah, I suppose. (laughs) Uh, but that's also because I, I, I take my my work, my, my poker very seriously. Um, so it just, it doesn't always, it's not always the case, but yeah, nine times out of 10, I let it dictate like whatever my plans are. And then when there's a spot when I'm not doing something, you know, a Friday or a Saturday, then that's free time. That's, I'm available then. But mm. I'll, I'll never be available on a Sunday because that's, you know, the when day I play the, online. that's the religion day. That's the religion yeah. day, the property. Or like any summer, you know, because I'm in Vegas for six weeks. You said earlier on that one of the things that makes you happy is learning new things. Um, this sounds like one area where that, that, that seems like it would be interesting, like learning how to be a better man in a relationship, right? Like mm-hmm. talk about, the things that you're interested in and interested in and have been interested in outside of poker. So yeah, we know you've learned how to play poker, but what mm. else have you been interested in and who have been the key mentors, books, training courses and stuff that have improved certain areas of your life? Yeah. Um, well, the first thing is obviously cooking. Um, so yeah, I try it. Uh, but I mean, that's sort of a, that was obviously a profession of mine. So, um, for hobbies or, or other passions, uh, I would say health and fitness always been a, a key component, component in my life. Like ever since I was about 15, uh, I played a few sports growing up, like team sports, like hockey. And, um, once hockey became too serious, like when we were eight years old in Sweden, it's very serious <laughs> from an early age. Uh, you know, we had, like six practices a week plus games on the weekends. Like it's intense. So I switched to floorball <laughs> uh, 
uh, indoor floorball, which was like a bit more relaxed and but still like a lot of fun. Uh, and I played basketball for a while, and then eventually, uh, when I was 15, I, I I found the gym and yeah, just started um, developing um, you know a health health routine. Became very uh, interested and dedicated to that, and I realized that it fit in my personality a lot better because, like I said, I've never been good at at committing to being at a place at a certain time and, or answering to authority, whether it be a trainer or, you know, teammates. I always prefer like being my own coach and then, you know, being responsible for, uh, for myself. Um, so that fit in, that sort of lifestyle fit in me or, or training style fit in me a lot better. Who were your big mentors in poker? And, and what made him so special? Uh, it's uh, it's also it's always been my friends, pretty much. Pretty much. So the more I, I kept traveling, the more people I met, and you know, everything snowballs into a new relationship, and then you meet people at the most random places and you start talking for one reason or another and the next thing like you're talking every day on Skype and then you start you know discussing hands and you play versus each other online and that's just kind of how it goes and then I think having friends um, and that are sort of your mentors in poker is incredible incredibly valuable because you kind of see what that they go through the same processes as you, like the highs and the lows, uh, winning huge amounts of money and, and losing uh, for long periods of time. Um, you can kind of support each other and help each other uh, get through it. Are you are you currently looking for? Oh, I scratch that question. Let's go back a little bit. Um, I know things are. Pretty motivating, you know. When you won the world championship, that obviously changed a lot, of, a lot of things in your life. But up until that point, what what were the biggest obstacles that you had to overcome in order for you to, you know, to reach the end goal when it came to poker? <laughs> the end goal to in poker. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, the obstacles I had to overcome was to to win a live tournament. That was my. Uh, I suppose my, uh, I wouldn't say end goal, but that was uh, like a huge milestone because I'd become close a lot of times. Uh, as you know, uh, I think I, I had uh, four or five second place finishes leading up to, to the main event, which was like my first um, major win. I won a small side event the uh, prior to that but uh that I, I just wanted to you know when you've been close so many times you're just wondering like what does it feel like you know when you're on this other side of the uh of the podium you see the winner and like he's celebrating with all his friends and like he looks so happy and like you know he won the tournament um so it's always like better sweet feeling finish finishing second so when you've never won anything big, you're always wondering what what is that feeling like? Like what if I just could win a tournament one day? Um, and yeah, then it, it happened <laughs> in, the, in the biggest, the biggest one form possible, uh, which was amazing and uh, highly unexpected, obviously. Um, but it wasn't the feeling itself wasn't as I expected it to be. Uh, it was a bit overwhelming, if I'm being honest, because uh, it wasn't something that I planned to. Or obviously, I planned on winning. Like that was my that was my end goal. As soon as I made the final table, or as soon as I entered the tournament, you, know, you always want to win. That's always your goal. But uh, during the time of preparation, like the three four months that we had. Uh, from making the final table to actually playing it out, that was all dedicated to to me getting better and being prepared to 
to play at the best, you know, like my highest level possible. Uh, so none of that was uh, dedicated to, you know, the feeling of winning or, you know, how to <laughs> deal with interviews or press or uh, exposure or uh, all that sort of stuff. So it was mental. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's hard to describe. <laughs> mm. um, but obviously, yeah, great, great experience overall. But one that was quite difficult to deal with at the time. I'll take it back to another difficult spot. I remember being just a few feet away from you through your entire final table performance in Deauville. And then you get heads up playing against a guy swinging a plastic rat around. And you had a big chip lead, I think, going in heads up as well. Like, I remember you losing that and thinking, wow, that's going to that's gonna hurt. Like, talk a little bit about what was going on. Yeah. That was, during that and afterwards more, I guess. Yeah. Uh, that was uh, probably one of the toughest defeats <laughs> of my poker career. Uh, listen to that guy. I, I didn't show a great deal of uh, sportsmanship. Uh, I thought that, and it also felt like at that point I had, I had done. That was, I think, my the second time I got second in the same EBT season. Yeah, like a few months close. earlier, mm. a few months prior to that, I got second to Toby Lewis. Um, in uh, Villa Mora. So obviously on a massive heater, getting two second places in, in one season. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I got gotten third, second, second, and I had a second in the WPT in Venice as well. So this was my third second place finish in, in, a, in a massive tournament. And also one that I had to ship lead in and I felt like I had a pretty good skill advantage versus uh, this local uh, French player who's uh, clearly not a, a professional. Um, so I, I, if I remember correctly, I felt a bit of an entitlement for the first time, like I deserved to win. Mm. So that was the hardest um, thing to deal with, I think, coming up short uh, to that guy. <laughs> was that was that um, was that something you had to check in with yourself on the entitlement, or was it just did it just come and go? No, I was just really disappointed at the time. Hmm. Yeah, I was there. I was there in in Venice as well when you came second as well. Oh yeah, yeah. And but but if money if money is not your primary motivator because you're obviously yeah. you're picking up big wins, you're picking up you know you're getting paid handsomely for being second. Then I can see how much is going to devastate you, yeah. you know, especially if you're super ambitious as well. But that's the thing about poker, and it's so you're so influenced by your previous performances and, and your current bankroll at the time. So you know, during that season, I had, I had a tremendous season all the way through, uh, getting second, 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 third uh, in a very short period of time. And uh, in, in Deville, I cash for half a million euros. Mm. <laughs> Great payday and, and, and a huge uh, achievement uh, looking back at it. But at the time, I, I just couldn't see that. I just couldn't enjoy the moment. I was just furious. You just, wa you just wanted, to, you wanted to kill a Frenchman with a plastic rat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what have been the biggest villains in your life? Um, and villain, a villain could be a person, it could be a thought, it could be a belief system. I mean, what, what, what has uh, been the, the thing that you've had a battle the most? Apart from that guy? Apart from the guy with the rat. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, probably um, procrastinating and you know, feeling that I'm having the feeling that I'm not good enough for whatever it may be and putting things aside and like not dealing with them straight away, not taking action, um, postponing things. Like that's something I'm constantly 
trying to get better at and, and approach in a different way. Well, especially when you have so much freedom, right? I mean, I, I imagine that you uh, financially secure, so you, you don't literally have to wake up and do X, Y, Z. So that could be a bit of a problem when it comes to procrastination, right? Yeah, but I think when you're under those constraints, then it's almost easier in a way because you know you know what you're going to do. You know what you need to do. Mm. So you have a clear path, whereas where you're in, in a situation where you don't need to uh, necessarily fight to put food, food on the table, you're, you have a lot more options and it can be a bit, uh, not to sound like a like privilege or anything, but it can be a, a bit difficult and, and overwhelming to, to find the right path. Like, what is it that I want to do? Like, where, where do I want to spend my time and energy? Uh, but right now, I am, I'm very dedicated to poker. But at the same time, I'm always keeping an open mind of what's next. It's really interesting because if you if you look at Joseph Campbell's archetype of the hero's journey, which is what this podcast is based on, you fit it so well. You know, because it, it's like, you know, guys in an ordinary world, this is an island in Sweden, he goes to this special world and battles all these obstacles, which you just talked about. And then they win the treasure, which is, you know, you can't get a better than the world champion wins 10 million quid, right? But then his archetype goes on to say the hero then takes that treasure, goes back to his ordinary world, and he makes it a better place. So basically what he's saying is you use your experience to make a difference in the world. Like, so how are you doing that now and how have you been doing that? I suppose... That chapter would be what's next, what's after poker. Right. And also, I suppose, you know, giving back and, and starting looking at where I can make a difference in the world and contribute more uh, time and energy and resources to um, aspects that that absolutely needs it and that's much more important than you know a mind game as, as poker like as fun as it is it doesn't really make a difference immediate difference at least in the world i think it can on a whole if if, if you have success in it like you you see it you look at players like dan smith and and, and shedway and they have tremendous results and, and myself as well uh, you know when um, when I won the, the main event and decided to get involved with Greg, uh, I think, yeah, if you're using poker as a tool to, um, to fuel or to have it fueled by motivation of wanting to do something bigger, I think that could be a great motivator. And, uh, I suppose a bit of a, a relief on your conscience because you're dedicating so much time to, towards like zero sum game that actually doesn't make a difference. It's a lot of fun, but you know, it's some players lose, some players win and you know, we play cards for, for a living. Like that's what we do. Um, so yeah, I think in the future I'll be looking at taking the, the concepts, the principles I've, and skills I've developed over my years playing professional poker, trying to find a purpose, a purpose and something I feel very strongly about and where can I apply these principles in a, a different area and actually make a difference. Do you have a kind of an inkling about what that's going to be yet? Or are you just doing typical Martin Jacobson? And just I'm doing typical Martin just... stuff where I'm just taking – one day at a time, uh, trying to keep an open mind and also utilize like all like opportunities that come around. Like whenever someone wants to meet, yeah, you know, I'm I'm there and I'm I'm mm -hmm. trying to trying to network and and because um, I've I've realized like over my career, like looking back, like one thing always leads to another. It's like a common theme of my life so far that like 
I can clearly see now, like with a little bit of life experience, that however things worked out. Uh, so I'm, even though I have no idea what I, what I want to do in the future, or what's what's next after poker, or how long poker is going to be around for, or how long I want to keep playing, um, I'm, it's not something I'm I'm very stressed about or even worried about because I know that everything's going to work out. And last thing before I let you go, it's just something personal I've always wanted to know. You know, I, I work on the Triton poker scene, you know, so I'm there at every stop with the world's greatest players, you know, playing for vast sums of money. And it, in the back of my mind, there's always this list of people I'm thinking, the, this guy should be here. Toby Lewis is one. I'm like, why ain't Toby here? You know, you're another. Why ain't Martin here? Um, mm. So why aren't, why aren't we see? Why did the, why has your ambition not led to you being seated at that table at a regular basis? Um, I think, I think it was sort of a, an unconscious decision I made a few years ago. I think I, I could have been there if I'd been ready for it and really wanted it, but um uh, I didn't. I guess my motivation for poker wasn't as high as it is today once that scene really started to open up. And uh, at the moment, I'm just, uh, you know, I missed so much of that, those early days and, and how um, that scene has developed. It's very close, as you, I'm sure you're aware, it's very like, close group like it's the same faces on every stop so i feel like if you haven't been there um from the start it's quite difficult uh market to break into uh require tremendous uh, amount of study and also to break into that that group because all those players uh, a lot of them are, are close friends and, and they share a lot of tools a lot of, um uh, a lot of information, a lot of resources. Um, so I think if you're out of that group, it's it's quite difficult to break into it. So it's it's not it's not a goal at the moment. It's just it's just over there somewhere. Do you, when you watch it no. on telly, it's also it's also very like it's a it's a full on commitment in my opinion. Mm, yeah, like it's not one of those things that like oh yeah I might go to try it in a year or whatever. Like either you're at all of them or you're you don't play them uh, because yeah like it's since it's such a small scene a small uh, player pool rather you get so much information by uh, participating and in, and in playing these events that if you lack that information even by just missing one or two then that could be um, a huge detriment in, in your expected success. Yeah, I also imagine backing would be difficult as well if you was if you had one foot in, one foot out. You'd you'd want yeah, your back, you'd sure. want your backer to be in one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. All those guys, you know, they they, they have solid backings, like solid results that back up their um, their commitment and their um, uh, success in those events, and they they all know that you know exactly what level they're at like skill wise uh, they all work together you swap action sell action amongst each other and yeah it's just a different uh, player pool really than what i'm currently doing mm-hmm. you know i'm more focusing on the bigger fields um the you know general live tournaments the main events the occasional high roller and, and online and you're a role model for a comp- for a different group of people, aren't you? You know, you represented eight eight eight, and yeah. so you're 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 the role model for people like me who just flicks it in and, and plays a Sunday tournament once in a while. The you people's champion, you can call me. The people's champion. <laughs> that that's a good way of ending it. Um, yeah. Martin, thank you for your time. You've been really candid. Really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for being a guest on Run It Once. Thank you.